This is Game Theory, our podcast about competition, strategy, and decision-making, hosted by me, Nick Andrews, and my brother, Chris. A reminder, you can watch the show in its entirety on Spotify and YouTube. You can read the full transcript of the episode on our website, the link to which is in the show notes. And if you have thoughts of your own, you can email us or respond to the open comment thread in Spotify. In this episode, we talk crypto. Unless you haven't been paying attention, cryptocurrency and NFTs are all the rage. People are making or losing tens of millions of dollars in Bitcoin or Dogecoin or whatever the next coin will be. They're adding tokens to online images and selling them for millions and millions of dollars. The proponents of cryptocurrencies argue for the freedom that comes from a cashless society and the power that people can wield over enormous centralized institutions. The opponents of crypto point out how the privacy provided by the cryptos makes it much easier to traffic in humans, drugs, and weapons. There's also another enormous drawback, the environment. Still, one world leader saw enough advantages to make cryptocurrency an official tender in his country, while citizens of most other countries grapple with who to sue if things go wrong. So, in episode 23, we answer the following. What the fuck is crypto? Welcome to another episode of the Game Theory Podcast, your podcast about decisions, and strategy, and policy, and the like. And Chris, we have a fun episode today about cryptocurrency. We're going to do the sexy topic that uh, everybody wants to talk about. We're not going to do the topic that we're scared of, like vaccines or climate change, which we did last time and we might do next time. We're going to do this more fun cryptocurrency thing and how it's going to change the world. But I want to start by shouting out uh, a couple of our listeners. First, a guy that we went to high school with. Uh, potentially, Dr. Jerry Stott. Jerry Stott, yeah, that guy has some of the most unique and insightful views in the entire world. Uh, brilliant guy, hilarious guy, really great, great guy, big heart. Uh, shout out to Jerry for having the courage to use some of our material in what appeared to be a real, actual college class, uh, the rest of whom to whom we can only apologize. <laughs> yeah, our, 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 bad, our, our bad. I hope that all of his PhD class really enjoyed uh, Raiders versus Chargers <laughs> the way that the, the rest of us did. Uh, how do I explain Jerry? Jerry is a guy whose sass and intellect were so on point at a young age. I imagine a lot of teachers were like, damn, I wish I could get drunk with that kid when he was like 16. Oh, for sure. Oh, I, I wish I could get drunk with Jerry right now. So Jerry, uh, wherever you are, if you're listening, uh, next time, we see each other, whatever we're doing, we got to stop what we're doing and get a drink, hang out. 100%, completely agree with that. I also want to give a shout out to, uh, we'll call her Dr. Allie, who is a resident who reached out, wants to discuss um, medical communication and how can we make things more accessible to patients well. And this is what we kind of, she and I had, had a back and forth. It's going to be really hard because, uh, and we're going to do a future episode on this too, Chris. Media that's free is essentially voting. You get to decide uh, what you like by what you click on. And that's how TikTok works and everything. So it doesn't matter what's important. What matters is what uh, gives you money. And that's sort of a good segue into what we're talking about today, which is cryptocurrency and NFTs. It's something that exists, but also something that we agree that exists and therefore it exists. And for those of you atheists out there screaming, that's what God's like, maybe one day we'll talk about that one one day. Yeah, maybe one day. <laughs> maybe one day. So uh, cryptocurrency took the world by storm back in 2017 when the graph started, stopped going like this and just went straight up into the sky. And now it's up and it's down and it's up and it's down. Uh, and Chris, it's, um, it's, it's like any other invention. Like I, I call it the Nobel complex. I'm sure someone smarter than me has coined it something else. But Alfred Nobel famously invented dynamite, which is why we can mine and why we can do all of these incredible things, but also why it's super easy to murder groups of people at one time. Like things are as good as they are bad. The internet has the dark web, sex trafficking, but it also can connect people and we can have an economy from home during a pandemic because of the internet. Sometimes things are as good as they are bad. Um, the cryptocurrency has such a strong positive thing going on right now that you don't hear about the negative parts. So we're going to get into both sides of, of what this is. And this is the second installment of our WTF series. We haven't done one in, in a while, literally since the first episode. So what the fuck is cryptocurrency? 
Yeah, cryptocurrency is absolutely wild. It's kind of like the realization of this futuristic dream of a cashless society. Mm. So, you know, the ba the basic concept behind money is, you know, in an oversimplified nutshell, things have value and people want to be able to trade that value without having to like physically trade things. I mean, it's the dif difference between bartering one good or service for another and just saying, okay, well, uh, I here's this thing that represents the value of the goods or services uh, and I'll take the value instead of like some tangible object or some uh, some receivable service. So cryptocurrency is basically a step beyond that. Mm. Uh, one of the big challenges with managing a whole financial system where you have this money that people just kind of agree is worth value of things in the economy is that there has to be a base level of trust, uh, trust in the system. And that means trust in major institutions like big banks. Uh, in the case of like state governments, you have to trust that the institutions that back those banks are going to act in the interest of investors to make sure that the money that people put into the banks, the value they add there, doesn't just go away. Uh, and that can be really challenging, especially in situations where, like, for example, big banks don't act in the best interest oh. of investors. No. And they do things like uh, back a bunch of loans for people who can't afford homes and crash the entire global financial system. Mm. Um, I'm no. not talking about anything in particular. This is a hypothetical. Um, and also, if that were to happen, we've solved the problem and it's definitely never going to happen again. Absolutely. Yeah. All the roadblocks are in place and we're completely safe. And those but who just in case. perpetrated the fraud are going to prison so that they can't do shit like that again with, say, cryptocurrency. Absolutely. Yes. So one of the cool things about cryptocurrency is that it's, in theory, supposed to address these problems with like trusting big institutions, these big like centralized organizations that are supposed to kind of control the flow of value back and forth uh, among consumers. Basically, one of the ways that cryptocurrency tries to address this problem of trust is by attempting to generate value using some kind of technical means that doesn't require trust in a central institution. It's supposed True. to be decentralized. So once everybody agrees that they've generated value in some way, then you can just trade that value automatically without having to go through like a central organization like a bank or a credit agency. Yeah, and we see this, this is a massive problem because the central organization is how every single aspect of business in most countries has always been run. And we'll get into some examples of how that's, it, certain companies have had problems with that in the past because where do you go? Where do you send mail? That kind of thing. Like, so the idea to me is like, what if Reddit were money where like everybody can be on the same page? And if you are a big fan of Reddit, you'd be like, this is a really earnest conversation about something that's really important. But what if it's bullshit? Right. Yeah. I mean, that that's one of the big issues is like, okay, you're supposed to have this, this decentralized form of money that's not linked to some kind of central banking system. But what that means is it requires just like a ton of buy-in from people who are free to participate. I mean, like the, the egalitarian nature of Bitcoin, where in theory, anybody can transact in it and anybody can participate in sending it back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, that means that you have to have a lot of people who are buying in. Otherwise, it's not really worth very much. And it's kind of just something that's made up. Yeah. And I think one of the ways that's illustrated is in like looking at how many forms of cryptocurrency there are. Mm. Uh, it's not because there's like some magical thing called a Bitcoin that people realize like, oh yes, we made this huge scientific discovery and Bitcoins have intrinsic value. Like, no, they've just been bestowed with value by people who sit behind computers and say, yep, I agree, this is valuable. Yeah, and but it, okay, so we I I suppose we should back up. So you can do things like mining Bitcoin in this blockchain technology, which is just assigning value to things that we agree have value. But this doesn't work without a a deeper form of technology for the most part, and that form of technology is something called an NFT. And if you've had your head in your sand, had had your head in the sand, you haven't heard about NFTs, but it means a non fungible token. Which all that really means is that you can sort of through data on the internet internet copyright something that just exists on the internet. You can put a signature on it, like your thumbprint essentially, and say mine or mine or unique or unique or unique or whatever. And so a non-fungible token can be assigned to a Bitcoin. And then theoretically, that would limit the amount of them, right? So one of the problems, and we've all thought about this with money when we were children, how do we agree that this stupid piece of paper is worth anything? It is a piece of paper it's completely, it's, it's worthless. This is a stupid idea that we all have. And cryptocurrency is no different. 
at all. All we do is assign this value to this thing. However, if there were just pieces of paper everywhere on the internet, then theoretically, it would have no value. It could just crash to zero at any point in time, similar to the, the Danish tulip thing that happened in the 1600s. So this non-fungible token can be assigned to things and therefore limit the amount of them that are in circulation. Now, now all, not all cryptocurrencies have these NFTs, but that NFT attachment to Bitcoin as a, after, as a cryptocurrency and any other cryptocurrencies like Ethereum or, or whatever, if they have an NFT attached to them, then theoretically, that is the beginning of decentralization. And now all we've done is made an internet dollar, but it's more volatile because it's not attached to a government. Yeah, so, so for those of you out there who, like me, saw the term or heard the term non-fungible token and started asking yourself the question, what in the hell is fungible? <laughs> yeah. uh, I just want to reiterate what that term means. Uh, I'm proud of myself for having learned it. It basically just means that a thing is a thing is fungible if it can be traded back and forth equivalently with like others of the same kind. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we're talking about currency like a dollar. If you find a dollar bill on the street and it's like a real no kidding US dollar, you can go trade it in for the dollar value at any store that's willing to supply goods of that worth. You can trade it for any other dollar. dollar. A dollar is a dollar is a dollar. So in that sense, dollar bills in the US economy are fungible. But what you're saying, Nick, is non-fungible tokens are not transferable one-to-one. -one. So like one Bitcoin with a non-fungible token is not the same as another Bitcoin with another non-fungible token. And like these tokens can basically assign uniqueness to things on the internet. Is that, am I, am I getting that right? Yeah. So basically, so the idea was that when someone, when people discover this non-fungible token, there's a company in Vancouver and I forget their name, my bad, uh, but we'll link to it. It's all in the show notes, the wall street journal, how stuff works and the economist, of course, great source, source material for this, but there's this company in Vancouver that figured this out. And what they originally thought was we could theoretically assign this non-fungible value to something super important, like the deed to your house or whatever. And then something that is just a piece of paper can become traded it can be, it become valuable because it exists on the internet. So you can use things uh, for collateral that you've never used before, but that was way ahead of its time. So they were like, well, that's not going to work. No one's going to care about that. It's a too mind blowing situation. It's similar to like Bill Gates inventing the touchscreen tablet in 1994, which he did, but it doesn't matter because there's no 4G network. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. This is a completely useless technology. So they had this brilliant idea, Chris, and this is so true. They were like, well, what are people, what will work? Well, cats will work. <laughs> on the internet <laughs> cats will work and it did so the idea was they created this game called i think it's, it was just called crypto kitties and it was like it was very similar to tamagotchi but it had nfts where you like can raise your cats and grow cats and like your cat on the internet your cat is a thing that exists with a non-fungible token and from there the idea really exploded and it, and it came to a fever pitch um for me with this piece of this artwork that sold i have tried to i forget the guy's name i think it's beeple Beeple sold a painting that he made on InDesign or on Photoshop or whatever edit, audit, editing system for photos. He sold a, a, a digital painting for $69 million. Just to put that in perspective, in, in 2020, there was a painting by a guy named David Hockney who was like, he was like, the the image of 1960s Los Angeles with like the stark uh, the, the bright color fields and the kind of minimalist design with like a pop of really exciting stuff like his painting the splash in 2020 uh, this iconic painting in the art world sold for 23 million dollars so like a third of this this digital NFTized painting that somebody else created just using their computer. Yeah. And now we've seen that was one of the first big ones that happened. And I remember reading the story in the Wall Street Journal and the art editor of the Wall Street Journal was invited to the auction. I forget by it was Sotheby's or you know, one of those Christie's or somebody was doing the auction. And the email said the bidding will this is the this is a quote. The bidding will start at one hundred dollars, period. It's going to be huge, period. And they're like, oh, pass. We're actually not going to go to that. Thanks, though, for this digital art auction. Sixty nine million dollars this sold for. And that was the beginning. Right. And now we see these NFTs assigned to things like basketball highlights and whatever. And ironically, crypto, whatever, punk or whatever the company's name is in Canada, they have started to lead the charge on like, well, now your marriage license can be NFT on the Internet and we can do all of these NFTs. We can assign this intrinsic value to things that perhaps didn't have value in the past where maybe you can put a painting on the Internet 
that's worth sixty nine million dollars and put that up for a loan or whatever in any way that you want. So this is that, attaching these NFTs and making things on the internet unique is, is a is a meme and a fad and owning a, a meme that you really liked on the internet would be really cool and millennials and nostalgic and all that. But the practicality of this has a lot more to do with turning invaluable things into value that you can have in your hand. And then of course, regulating ish or making limited cryptocurrency. And when you can do that, then it's a, an idea that people can wrap their minds around. But Chris, not all of them have NFTs. Yeah. So, well, so I, I think one of the, one of the ways I try to understand NFTs is by considering the difference between NFTs that are assigned to stuff like art, like digital images, yeah. and then the NFTs that you're talking about where you can get like real world things assigned some token in some digital universe yeah. or maybe a metaverse uh. and consider what that means for like social implications. So like, I, I think, I think for the average person who's not like a crypto bro, who's really into this kind of stuff and like has bought into the NFT concept and, and sees how big and important this whole art sale thing is. It's hard to understand like, okay, so it's a non-fungible token for a digital image that I can just right click and save as, and then I have exactly the same copy of the image. So like I've basically just made it fungible or I can, I can like take a screenshot and take this non-fungible thing and make it fungible and just steal it. Well, it kind of, I, I yeah. mean, that's not really the point of what the non-fungible token is. It's just a silly example because anybody can right-click and save an image on the internet. Yeah. Where the fungibility co or the non-fungibility comes into play is when it does represent like unique individual created things. And I think that's easier to see in, in other things other than art. So recently, uh, the metaverse has become a concept that's kind of like in vogue for like the next, okay, what's the next step? Like we have the internet of things yeah. where you're, all your devices like your refrigerators and cell phones and laptops and TVs and washing machines and all that kind of stuff is connected by electronic signals that can communicate with each other and, and it's great. And it's linked to the internet and you can browse the web and, and all this right. stuff. Yeah. Well, the next step beyond that is to just say, okay, well, let's just take everything digital and all of a sudden all these like unique important things like the deed to your house yep. or your wedding certificate or the you know, the, the parking tickets you Chris, have Chris I've often said that and this is a thing that people don't know about you that for years in high school when you would travel we would go to sports camps and you would do speech and debate and all this stuff uh me and our parents would have really liked it if there was some sort of copy of your driver's license when you flew that you couldn't physically lose. That's what you're talking about, right? So that you don't have to get searched as airport security because you forgot your ID. Yeah, exactly. Ah, and, nice. it, and it it would have to be a thing that's like, that's different than just somebody taking a picture of a driver's license and saying yeah. like, oh, I swear it's my driver's license. Somehow through the, through like the crypto process, the the non fungible token would have to be assigned in a way that like other people couldn't just like replicate. They could yep. just copy and paste and say like, oh no, that's actually my driver's license. That's actually my social security card. Right. Um, a good starting point of this might be like vaccine cards. Yeah. So like you have to generate some kind of unique signal or some kind of unique identifier that <laughs> gets assigned to a person and that you can look it up in some kind of database and just scan a thing and say right. like, yep, okay. We know without replication or copying, this thing has been assigned a value, and that value is, all right, you've been vaccinated, or, exactly. or whatever the case is. So that's how the NFT, that, that's part of this is NFTs, and that's a really important thing, and that's a bit of a sidetrack for us. So like, with regard to cryptocurrency, they don't all have those. Bitcoin does, I think Ethereum does, but some of them don't, which means that theoretically, you could just create more of your own. Now, there are some meme ones, the most famous of which is called Dogecoin. Now, a Doge Dogecoin, is a dog. Yes. Yes, Dogecoin is a dog that was a meme. It's the dog that looks like at you like, uh, ha, ha, and it's, I think it's a Japanese breed of dog, and it's a famous meme on the internet. It's a picture of a dog, and they turned that thing into a cryptocurrency because screw it, why not? And then Elon Musk got involved, and he's like this god of cryptocurrency. So that, that's where this gets dangerous. That's called the pyramid scheme. But if there's fungibility in these, these cryptocurrencies, then theoretically, they could be a currency. Now, using cryptocurrency is... A, being incredibly bullish on the general economy and people continuing to buy into this. And B, um, I, think, I think incredibly optimistic that everyone's going to agree. But it, Chris, it presents enormous challenges and things that nobody could see coming like any other mind-blowing uh, bit of technology. So when a dollar is not a dollar, but a dollar is a thing that doesn't exist except for on the internet, there are huge problems. And we're going to get into some of those problems. But first... I want to take a break. I want to talk about, I want to do a recommendation segment. We usually save this for the end. 
But I have a recommendation for all of you. This woman, Chris, her name is Heather Robertson. And Heather, Heather Robertson, Robertson. Heather Robertson is a YouTuber and she's a fitness person. And she's got a line of gear and she sells, you know, leggings and sports bras and things like that. So Heather Robertson is who my wife used during the pandemic to work out when you couldn't go to gyms. And what we found out about her is that a, her workouts are incredible. From a YouTube standpoint, this is amazing. She does every motion with multiple angles. My favorite thing about it is one of the things I hate the most about workout classes and spinning classes is that I don't want to talk to you and I don't want to hear you talking to me. I want my podcasts, I want my audiobooks, and I want my music shut up. She doesn't talk. She just does the motion. And it's got huge numbers on there. It's like when I would do Peloton, it doesn't say what the instruction is. I have to listen to them and I don't want to hear chad in brooklyn tell me what he's doing i don't care but heather's just like she does like the three second explainer like this is the motion and then okay in 10 seconds we're going to do the motion and she does the motion there i don't know how many videos she has i would ballpark like two to four hundred somewhere in there there are playlists of workouts for based on time based on body size based on whatever you're trying to work on based on your goals cardio strength stretching all of that She's incredible. And there are Facebook support groups. She's got meal planning, but it's all non-judgmental. It's done in a studio. It's incredible work. And uh, I've done a couple and they're really hard. Body weight shit is hard. I don't care how much you can lift or how much you can run. Body weight calisthenics are, are hard. So that's my recommendation for anybody that wants to do something simple, non-judgmental, and not have like a fitness guru yell at you. Heather Robertson, and it will be in the show notes. Would it be better to do those workouts if you just kept increasing your body weight? Uh, but yeah, well, one way to do them would be to do the workouts and eat protein, I suppose. I suppose. Mm, I'm going for a different approach. <laughs> it seems like a good recommendation. <laughs> yeah, I, I highly recommend her. She's, she's the best. And you may have already heard about her. She's incredibly popular. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some of the negatives of cryptocurrency. And one big negative is the volatility of this cryptocurrency. So we're going to talk about everybody knows it's up, it's down, Bitcoin up and down, it should go up, it should go down, like you should have got in back in 2012. Here's an anecdote of how weird this can get. And this is an anecdote of A, the volatility of cryptocurrency, and B, how regulators have no idea what to do with it. Odell Beckham Jr. is a very trendy, hip, and, and pretty smart uh, it, by all intents and purposes, marketing person. He's very smart professional football player for the Los Angeles Rams. This year, when he signed his signing bonus for $750,000, he elected slash demanded, which you're allowed to do. It's a legally recognized tender sort of now in the United States to be paid in cryptocurrency. At that time, they gave him $750,000 worth of cryptocurrency. As of the pay date of his, his roster bonus, cryptocurrency had experienced a crash, which as we're recording this happened, depending on when you're listening, 7, 10, 20 days ago, early 2022, it crashed. I mean, it didn't go to zero, but it went way down. So people lost hundreds of millions, billions of dollars in some instances. Odell Beckham Jr. lost 50% of that value. However, the United States government was like, I don't care what Bitcoin's worth. The dollar is worth one. And so you need to be taxed that the original amount was 750,000. So that tax rate it was about 480,000. That means that he had about 500,000, about 480,000. He was taxed about 480,000. At the end of the day, his $750,000 signing bonus, he was paid less than 40 grand. Unbelievable. For, Unbelievable. for a guy in the NFL who's making that kind of crazy money, it, it's, it's unreal that he, he basically just ended up making a bad bet. Mm -hmm. the, the, the currency that he was paid was so volatile and its value so... I don't know if misunderstood is the right term. It, it's, yeah. it's not universally agreed upon enough right. for it to like remain relatively stable. So like for this NFL guy, like, I mean, that's, that's crazy. I mean, he can afford that kind of loss, but right. man, that, that's absolutely wild. Right. And so, and, and, and Bitcoin can go back up for those of you crypto bros yelling at us. Yes, I know it can go back up. But at the end of the day, if you aren't making disposable income, like Odell Beckham is making, you cannot have this happen. And there are practical implications of this. Uh, let's see El Salvador, who went and used this as a national currency, Chris. Yeah, so in, so in September last year, in 2021, uh, El Salvador officially became the first country that would accept cryptocurrency as legal tender. It, it accepts the dollar and crypto. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, when the market for cryptocurrency plummets and it's, or, or when its value is so unpredictable, that makes it really challenging for a government to try to control 
the economy within its borders and like make sure that people can like afford to buy things that they need to survive. It, it, in fact, it's so bad. The IMF is formally pushing for El Salvador to like stop accepting Bitcoin as legal tender. Yeah. You know, they released a statement this week. So, uh, this is the week of uh, we're recording on the 26th of January, 22. The IMF said there are large risks associated with the use of Bitcoin on financial stability, financial integrity and consumer protection, as well as the associated fiscal contingent liabilities. They they want El Salvador to stop doing this because it's so dangerous and so risky and they could stand to lose so much value and really hurt people by trying to like be the first to catch this wave of the future. Yeah. And so that like there are political motivations here. The guy in El Salvador who's president is, has become a bit of an authoritarian and he is a very scary person, uh, very young, very sexy, he got rid of all of the judges in opposition. He also forced through the ability to become elected president for a second term, which was previously illegal in El Salvador. So this guy is kind of just in charge. He just kind of took over El Salvador. Yeah, um, on, on Friday, his name is President Nayib Bukele. Mm -hmm. uh, on Friday, he tweeted that he bought an additional $15 million of what he described as really cheap Bitcoin uh, <laughs> as the market plummeted. So, Good. You know, and, and considering that apparently, according to CNBC, right now, the Bitcoin value is down 50% from its all-time high, mm -hmm. which happened in November, like two months ago. Right. So it lost half its value in less than two months. Uh, it's unbelievable to me that the president of a country is trying to like just generate some buy-in with his social media account because the value of cryptocurrency and really the fate of his presidency, like his legacy, his country. is tied to like people buying in and just like influencing people to just say, like, okay, well, I agree. This, this does have value after all. Yeah. Well, and that's why the volatility is because then everybody's like, oh, it's cheap. I'll buy some. And then there's more stuff in the market, which seems a lot like a pyramid scheme. And perhaps it is at the end of the day. But unlike Odell Beckham Jr., one of the most highly compensated Americans on the planet or people on the planet, probably in the 1% of all earners in the world, he can afford to lose $400,000 on day. That's, I mean, I'm sure it's going to piss him off, but I'll be like, all right, he can sit on it for years and be like, oh, look, it's back at four times what it ever was. And I can cash it out now. He can do that. El Salvador's economy is in the gutter because of a civil war, which was backed on both sides. The government and the guerrillas were backed by drug lords, of course, and they're having all of these enormous problems. So, and this is what's crazy. The veterans of the El Salvadorian army and the guerrilla army are both in agreement that please stop accepting this as cryptocurrency. Now, I will give El Salvador credit in like when your country is in such a shithole economically, trying something aggressive makes a ton of sense. Now, I think that rolling this out as like a soft opening and seeing that like, okay, here are the positives of this. We can be global. The negatives of this are like people can't buy bread if Elon Musk tweets a weird GIF about the value of Bitcoin. Is, so is, think, is tweeting a GIF similar to tweeting a GIF? Uh, I'll tweet you. Yeah, I think so. I, I can't decide. I thought I was going to buy into the GIF thing. Are we going to, what are we doing? Are well, we gonna are, are you gonna are you gonna give your friends a bunch? Of, are you gonna give your friends gifts at Christmas? That's a good call, actually. I appreciate that. You I don't. I don't care. It. I don't care what the guy who invented the file format says. <laughs> GIF is GIF. That's, GIF I, is GIF. It's also a delicious agree, peanut yeah. butter, which is my recommendation. Buy GIF. Stop saying it. Describe <laughs> a GIF file name. There are GFF files as well. Like those, there are GIF files. That's a good point. I I appreciate that. That is. That is a good call. So on top of the volatility, all of this El Salvadorian stuff, there are other problems. There are two major, major, major problems. One of which is that, hey, this shit is decentralized and unstable. A. Well, th there's a third problem because oh, I think good. I know what you're going to say for the second uh -huh. one. Yeah. And just real quick, I want to jump in with that one. Uh, cryptocurrencies arguably are easier to use for money laundering Correct. and terrorism financing. Correct. Which is why... Countries like Russia, for example, are considering yep. a ban on cryptocurrency, even though Russia is the third largest mining, like Bitcoin mining country in the mm -hmm. world. Yeah. So we, and this is what this I, a report that I listened to about that was published about six months ago in preparation for this podcast. Uh, the United States was in a place where, like, and other European countries mostly were had to beg countries who they famously didn't get along with, like, hey, there's some fucking problems here. Like we can't trade it. People are losing stuff. And what are we going to do? So there's this company, Binance, which was a Bitcoin exchange. It was like the New York Stock Exchange, Toronto, Nikkei, all rolled into one. This is where crypto is traded on Binance. 
Well, people lost a ton of money. One time Binance crashed and people lost millions and millions of dollars because the app didn't work. Binance was just a company that was formulated and founded in the image of cryptocurrency. Decentralization, it's just on the internet, whatever, no headquarters. Well, when Americans lost their money, as Americans are wont to do, they're like, we're going to sue the shit out of you. Yes. Where do you send the letter? They couldn't figure <laughs> right. out where to send the letter. Right. So like, that's, that's one of the big challenges that, that people have with cryptocurrencies. Like, okay, this, if, if, if it's supposed to represent a system of finance where people can easily generate value. Yeah. Like, the, the decentralization means that, well, okay, people are losing all kinds of value. We have to regulate this somehow. And then we're back to square one. Like, this is the exact function of central banks. This is yeah. the exact function of finance ministries in governments like to prevent catastrophic loss of value like this. And, you know, so to, to me... This is kind of, you know, I, I don't want to be just some kind of backward Luddite that's like, oh, yeah, well, this is a new thing. And so therefore it must be bad. All technology is wrong, blah, blah, blah. I mean, odds are there's going to be a cashless society at some point in the future. Sure. I don't think we're ready for that now, though. And to me, it's kind of emblematic of this like general approach to like, like, like there's like a certain lifestyle that just wants to go, we, I'm disrupting, we, <laughs> and not really thinking about what the actual consequences are. Like it's the embodiment of we figured out that we could, but we didn't ask if we should <laughs> like, well, yeah, of course people want to have stuff free of regulations because that means they can make all kinds of crazy gambles and risks and whatever. But when it's other people's livelihood on the line, like for example, the citizens of a country, it, it, it can't be up to crypto bros who just want to convince everybody to like add value to their portfolio by buying in right. to, to determine like the economic well-being of people who don't really understand this stuff or aren't involved or don't really care about it. And so this like need, this, this impulsive drive to just disrupt is really creating a lot of problems uh, in places where it, it, we're not ready for this kind of move just yet. Yeah, and like the idea of a cashless society, and like I'm, I'm on board with both sides of this argument. I definitely think that Bitcoin is a thing that will exist and that will have, but it's, it's like anything else. You've got to be, and it, you, we saw this and it famously depicted in the movie, uh, The Social Network, like at a point in time, like it's time to put on your suit and tie and be a fucking company and you have investors and you're going to have a boardroom and like you can disrupt and have sleeping pods on campus at Facebook, but if Facebook's going to be Facebook, you've got to be a company. That's like, this is how things are going to function. And yes, you're right. The, the monkey suit crap in Wall Street is bullshit. However, you still have to be an adult at some point. And like, so that's, that's where I'm at with cryptocurrency. I think it is right now. It's just chaos. And people are like, it's a great way to buy like sex slaves. It's a great way to buy weapons. It's so dark that nobody knows what to do with it. And if you don't think this is happening, that's, it's a gold rush right now. Yeah, dark it, it's, it's a it's huge a problem. Rush. And then on top of all that, I'm going to get to what I think was going to be the third problem on the list. That you said you said there were two and I jumped well, in. Yeah, one. so like crime was one. One I was like uh, ransomware is really a big part of this. But yes, continue. Uh, the third one, I think, Crazy. is uh, is one that's pretty clear to everybody. Uh, and it's on the minds of a lot of people, especially like the younger you are. I think the more attention you pay to this now. Uh, there are huge environmental problems Which associated is wild. with mining cryptocurrency. Wild. Uh, we didn't really explain the mechanics of how this works, mm -hmm. but it requires a lot of computers basically just running all the time and doing a lot of calculations. And uh, in order to do those calculations, I mean, you need just like a ton of servers. You need just a lot of computers doing a lot of things, and that takes a lot of energy. And so the more cryptocurrency that's mined, that means a lot of energy output, a lot of energy costs. And so in addition to introducing the possibility of protecting yourself from being discovered for like committing crimes, like money laundering, terrorism, financing, sex trafficking, you name it. Ransomware, yep. In addition to the crazy volatility that cryptocurrency introduces in markets when everybody hasn't bought in yet, and because they're decentralized and not regulated, you're also just absolutely taking a dump on the environment. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's not, it's not good. I mean, the, 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 the carbon footprint of cryptocurrency mining is just, it's just unbelievable. So that's part of this that I think is really interesting because like volatility, solvable, decentralization, solvable, uh, tracking it to find illegal activity, activity, solvable. This one does not seem solvable. This one just seems like it's bad. It will never not be bad. Yeah, so there, there are some, you know, obviously people are aware that this is a huge environmental problem. It's not like there's these big cryptocurrency barons that are like trying to convince everybody that it's not happening. Right. So there are some ways that 
people are trying to get around the the, the huge energy cost. Uh, one of those is called proof of stake. Uh, the, the the basic idea is you know, to use you know, decisions about updating blockchain aren't made through like computers trying to like out compute each other, uh, but instead their decisions about the value based on the votes of the holders of cryptocurrency, like the people who are making decisions that you mentioned earlier yeah. on it, voting power, as well as a share of the rewards depend on how much holders are willing to like wage on what the end result is going to be. So yeah. it's kind of like a collective game theory, decision-making process on what the value of the currency is. And that does use less energy, uh, but it's also much more complicated. It's a difficult process and it's not applicable to every major currency. I mean, for example, Bitcoin does not use proof of stake yep. uh, as a means of, of, of establishing value. Yeah, and, and I, so I just don't know if these methods are going to be enough to to make a dent in it, especially when a lot of the cryptocurrency mining takes place in countries that don't have like incentives to stop using energy, like Russia, Kazakhstan, the United States. Yeah, exactly. And I think when you look at where there's fat that can be trimmed. Uh, in terms of environmental impact, that's a really big one that sticks out like a sore thumb because even though that the crypto conversation really dominates media, and this is something that you learn in journalism school, ha ha ha, let's play I went to party school. Um, <laughs> one thing that happens in media is that these stories are not applicable to the majority of people. Man bites dog, right? The famous journalism adage is dog bites man, not a story. Man bites dog is a story. Well, hundreds of thousands of people will be playfully or aggressively bitten by a, a dog today. That's impactful. That's why it's not a story. But hundreds of thousands of men will not aggressively bite a dog today. That's why. Can you it's imagine a story. if that happened? Honestly. I would. Yeah, it seems like a Michael Bay movie, to be honest with you. <laughs> and Mark Wahlberg will save the day. <laughs> yeah, and, and you're you're exactly right. And like, so when when the when the problem that we introduced at the very top of the show, where people lose trust and faith in big institutions, like that, uh, when when that challenge shifts to like decentralization, basically you end up coming all the way around full circle. To where now, okay, you're trusting a bunch of people who are like just using computers in far flung areas of the world to generate, use a ton of energy to generate non fungible value, or in some cases, you know, with this with this proof of stake concept, just decide how much a cur cryptocurrency is worth. Uh, th this guy David Rosenthal was kind of like on the leading edge of, of crypto many years ago, and he had this quotation in the Economist uh, when they ran a story on this. He said, you waste all these resources only to end up with a system that is controlled by people you have even less reason to trust than those who run conventional financial institutions. <laughs> so now, instead of running into the problem where we can't trust big banks and, and central monetary control mechanisms, now all of a sudden we're supposed to just like, what, trust a bunch of crypto bros who are trying to convince you to buy into meme coin or doge coin or avalanche or Ethereum or Bitcoin or whatever the flavor of the month is. Yeah, and it, it's, like it's just crazy. It's like any other pyramid scheme. Um, and I know, I'm not sure that it's quite a pyramid scheme. It's far, 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 far more complicated than that. But the idea is if you get in early on one of these things, you'll never have to work again. And that part of it is what's really scary because it just incentivizes new crypto, new crypto, new crypto. And as a result of that, they're, they're it's just going to be a race. I remember when in Australia, people started to discover what synthetic marijuana was and the regulators couldn't keep up because they could just alter some of the genetic code and be like, oh, okay, now it's a different thing. And this is legal and this is legal and this is legal. They just repeat the cycle over and over and over again. And so we're seeing that happen. But what I was going to say, Chris, is that only 2% of people care about this. And that is an, a high estimation in the United States where we are one of the most learned countries on the planet, the majority of people just don't care. But it seems like everybody cares because the media is obsessed with it and the media should be obsessed with it because it's crazy. Like this is an unbelievable revelation that we're able to, to do this kind of thing. But right now, it, it seems like the vast, vast majority of humans on the planet are in agreement like, I don't know about this. I don't like it. Yeah, it just feels kind of weird. It, it, it's it's precisely the decentralized aspect that leads people to withhold trust, I think. Yeah. I mean, the concept of not having some kind of central controlling mechanism, like some kind of levers that the government can pull, it, you know, it, it's, it's basically like a libertarian wet dream where <laughs> like, oh, well, let the people decide and let the market determine what the value is. Like, okay, but what ends up happening in that situation is like people lose control of the beast that they create. And when they do regain control, all of a sudden the trust just isn't in a government. It's just in other people who have no means of accountability. So when it has to do with people's livelihood, yeah, like people have good reason to to lack trust. Yeah, just just to kind of kind of wrap up this whole concept of 
anybody can create it and anybody can can make value that we can all just potentially agree on and like how this really easily accessible but not easily controllable thing has impacts in the real world uh, you mentioned dogecoin earlier so billy marcus was the guy who created dogecoin mm -hmm. and he basically just used a bunch of computer methods to create dogecoin like that's the simplest possible explanation for it and uh, when elon musk got involved he said well you know this can't be responsible for uh, an increase in fossil fuel consumption or carbon output and so somebody on twitter asked billy marcus uh, did you consider the environmental impact of Dogecoin mining when you created it? To which he replied, I made Doge in like two hours. I didn't consider anything. <laughs> which is true. That guy, I listened to the interviews of that guy, and he's like, he's just like anybody else, I can't believe this is happening. <laughs> right. It's 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 just crazy. It's like when Fallout Boy wrote that song, Centuries, and then it got yeah. played everywhere for like three years. Like, there's no way they could have known what kind of right. monster they were I creating know. with that. I think that it was... Um, whichever band and if there's an older person out there who can remember bands from the 70s and the 80s yeah. i think cherry cherry pie was a song like that and they were like the band was like it's making us actually it's impacting our mental health we hate the song so much because it's so much more popular <laughs> than anything else and like it's it's <laughs> like a meme like cherry pie you're gonna google it google it yeah i, I gotta go i'm embarrassed that i don't know she's warrant. my warrant yeah well you don't know him for anything else no cherry i don't i don't they're like those one-hit wonders like hot girl uh, like walks Sugar into Loaf. bar an 80s movie cherry pie like it's it's everywhere so they, they were they, they've been on interviews in rolling stone and stuff saying like i we want to blow our brains out like we hate the song we, we actually don't want to be a band anymore like the song is so much more popular than anything else all right chris so um i do have a shout out so about this time last year you married me and my lovely wife we're coming up on our on our one year anniversary which is really exciting i think the one year anniversary is the paper anniversary it is the paper anniversary so i'm yeah. going to nft one of our wedding pictures nft it what kind of yeah. nft are you going to print it on i have no idea but i'm gonna sell it on ebay and see what happens to us maybe we'll never have to work again maybe <laughs> never just maybe. maybe just maybe like rate review subscribe it's available on youtube you can watch on spotify as well if you have comments there will be a poll there will be a prompt and we'll link to our Facebook page in the show notes as well if you want to participate in any conversation. Chris, and if you feel you like it. giving us tips for the high-quality podcasting yes. that you appreciate, we accept all kinds of digitally mined currencies. 